You're tuned into news across the galaxy where they talk all things LA Galaxy with the Nag Boys. Let's start nagging. Hello, fellow Gs. This is Edgar coming at you from NAG Studio East. Last night, LA Galaxy finally beat FC Dallas, breaking a string of losses to the team from the Lone Star State. Now, LA Galaxy heads off to the Windy City in a matchup that offers quite the opposite situation. You see, unlike with FC Dallas, LA Galaxy have had a lot of success over Chicago Fire over the last decade and change. In fact, the last time that Chicago won was on August 2nd, 2010, at a match played at the Home Depot Center. Chicago has beaten the Galaxy only once in the last 16. Is this about to change? To help us try and tackle this question and give us a comprehensive preview of this upcoming match at Soldier Field, please welcome a good friend of the show, Nick from Glasshouse Soccer. Edgar, great to be back with you, man. How have you been? I mean, all right, you know, dealing with this nice, comfortable weather out here, you know, it's in the 70s, nice May gray, people complaining about it. I'm like, you won't be complaining come August and September when you're like stuck to your your your, uh, your furniture from the heat and the humidity. <laughs> but yeah, no, having a, having a great time out here. Uh, Galaxy, you know, they, they're, they're not perfect, but they're doing all right. They're doing all right. I'd love to be where the Galaxy are right now as a Chicago Fire fan. Like, that would be more than enough to keep me happy this summer right now. Yeah, well, thank you, thanks again for joining us, Nick. Uh, sure. It seemed like the Chicago Fire was about to turn things around with the return of Red and the snazzy new Red Kids, which are chef's kids. Um, what happened? What has happened? I mean, they it seemed like they started off okay, and then... Well, it it was when they lost to Charlotte in your jersey poll. I think that just tanked everyone's expectations. Oh, that's no. that's really the cause <laughs> of the downward spiral. Uh, but no, like everyone was really in a just in a dark place. Oh, there you go. Everyone was in a dark place in the off season because they were bringing back the front office. Found out they were gonna give Frank Klopas the official manager tag, no longer the interim. Uh, and everyone was just like, you're just you, you're one of the worst teams in MLS and you're going to run it back. All of a the sudden they get Hugo Kuypers, they get Kellen Acosta, they get Andrew Goodman, they get Aragoni, you know, Mueller's back from injury. And everyone goes, actually, this team looks pretty darn good on paper, but they just could not figure out any of the tactics to approach some of their opponents. Uh, they've been playing just a lot on good vibes like Klopas is just trying to put out a good atmosphere and kind of let the guys figure it out on the field. And you can't do that in today's MLS. You need to have a a specific way to play. You need to have tactics and adjustments that just haven't been made. And, and the fire just, you know, losing is a habit as much as winning is a habit. And they seem to really get down on themselves. So along those general lines, like for galaxy fans, just watch the fire's body language. If you start to see one, two heads drop, you're going to see three, four, five heads drop. You're going to see the bench put their head in their hands. That's when you guys know you've got the game won. However, winning's contagious too. Goal scoring could be contagious as long as Frank Klopas isn't subbing out goal scorers like he did in their uh, weeknight match against Orlando. Kuypers gets the equalizer. He's subbed out a minute later. So as long as we're not making those kind of silly decisions, and if we can get an early goal, then you might see a different tempo and tone from the fire so that's kind of the the general sense of the of the season so far yeah another subject i wanted to ask you about uh was uh the attendance to soldier field because i think i know things weren't perfect uh it was it toyota park right uh yeah it was it was toyota park it was seat geek stadium but yeah out in yeah. Uh, the suburb of bridgeview yep yeah things weren't perfect there it was kind of a distance from uh, chicago proper and um then there was the new ownership, and they're like, "We're bringing the team back to Chicago," and there was they made a big deal about the return of Red, and 
you would think that uh, people would return in mass to watch the team play at the stadium, but every time I look at the highlights, it doesn't look like that. It 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 it, it sucks. It hurts because I uh, I always uh, support the legacy clubs in particular in MLS, and to see you know one of the legacy clubs um, suffer like that, it 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 bothers me because I want to see these teams succeed where you have teams popping up in cities like Atlanta and Nashville and Charlotte, which um, you would never think, right, 10, 20 years ago that soccer would get that much support there, but they're drawing very healthy audiences. And then you have Chicago, which is a large metropolitan area, uh, which has had a rich tradition of, of the sport there. And the team is struggling to bring people into the stadium is is this a result of bad marketing? Is it a result of what's the product on the field? Or is it a combination of a lot of other things? Yeah, I'd say the two biggest factors going into it, it's the performance on the field. And then it's the Chicago weather. I mean, you're looking at an opening weekend in February, March mm -hmm. in, in the Midwest on the lakefront. So you, the weather, is, it's going to be hit or miss. And that that is going to affect attendance. I don't want to dwell on that too much because they, there is a lot more going on with the club. Uh, but the results aren't there, so the fans aren't. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, this was the first year that I decided to to buy in as a season ticket member, and I really enjoyed my experience as as that. They they really are doing their best as a club to help your season ticket membership, give you value for that. If you buy two season tickets, you get free parking. Uh, they just introduced wow. a program where you can reserve any of the game day giveaways for for fifteen dollars so if you want to get that chicago fire baseball jersey or hockey jersey or the zach thornton bobblehead you can reserve that as a season ticket member uh you get priority entrance a uh, half hour before the general public and so you can kind of partake in all the pregame stuff uh, i love it i can bring my son in we can do all the pregame festivities before all the general admission tickets come in so like they really are doing a lot to help out the season ticket members uh, and in addition, they are doing so much from a marketing perspective to try and bring casual fans and make them regulars and then try to get non-fans to, to become a casual fan. They have done so many theme nights, uh, ticket packages. They did a Greek night where you buy a ticket, you get a scarf, you meet Frank Klopas and Yorgos Kutsias. They, they did a Belgian night, same thing. Ticket, scarf, autograph. Uh, and picture with Hugo Kuipers. They they even did an Albanian night, and Shakiri was there. Nice. I don't, and <laughs> I, I was at that game. There were tons of people wearing their Albanian shirts all over the place. I didn't realize nice. how big of an Albanian population was in Chicago, though I shouldn't be surprised. But they are really doing what they can. Creative ticket packages, fun marketing, all this stuff to really get people into, into the gates. The last part of it, is the on the field performance, unfortunately? Yeah, yeah I was going to say it, it. The other foot has to drop right at some point. Yeah, uh, and unfortunately, uh, it sounds to me like missed opportunities. Um, I was just uh, I was just chatting with our, our good friend Nathan Derrick from Vancouver. Uh, he covers yeah. the Whitecaps about the situation up there when uh, you know with Inter Miami and how for the longest time right the game was marketed as a mess he's coming to canada he's gonna come up to the North pacific northwest and they sold i don't know how many thousands of tens of thousands of tickets right packages people traveling from all across canada and even the u.s right to watch Messi play up in bc place turns out you know he's not going and then what do you do right um they still managed to pack the place which is a beautiful stadium if you've never gotten the chance you gotta go but they managed to pack, you know, to pack BC Place, and they have this great opportunity to do something big against, you know, the top team in MLS, and they don't. They end up losing. And I was just telling Nathan, like, gee, this is like a running theme across the history of MLS, where teams, especially home teams, have an opportunity to do something big at home, and there's they end up losing, and it's a missed opportunity to to attract uh, casuals or to try to bring people that aren't used to coming to a game like that to return, mm -hmm. right? And I decided it's a missed opportunity. And then I look at what's going on in Chicago and I'm listening to you tell me about all these great things that the marketing department is doing. 
And then you look at the result on the field. And once again, I'm thinking to myself, oh, so many missed opportunities. All Chicago has to do is, well, sounds easy. All Chicago has to do <laughs> is find the right ingredients to put together a decent or a good team that can compete MLS, right? Yeah. Well, I will say they, I have noticed at a lot of the home games, they're really starting to get a lot of the youth teams uh, from the city, from the suburbs. So they're starting to open up some more of the seats in the upper deck, which normally they only release for Bears games. Uh, and you're seeing just like a couple hundred kids just so happy to be at a live soccer match jumping up and down. I don't know if they're giving those tickets away or if they're just highly discounting them because then I'm sure they'll make their money back on the ice cream those kids take down. But they <laughs> they are doing a great job getting a lot of the youth teams in there. Specifically to the Messi situation, what happened in Vancouver happened in Chicago, but the Chicago fans didn't get the heads up at the time. Messi was still listed as questionable even after the flight left without him from Miami to Chicago. And I'll <laughs> give uh, the club credit. First, I'll give it the players credit because they put on a heck of a match. It was a thing. It was a four-one or four-two victory. Shakiri had like two goals and two assists that game. It was like the best game the guys ever played. Maybe the only game worth remembering from his tenure here at Chicago. Uh, but what the club did for those people who bought tickets, they were offering them discounts. Uh, it was like a twenty, maybe twenty twenty-five percent discount if you purchased a ticket for another game that season and if you became a season ticket member they were giving you further discounts on season tickets so they wanted to try and make up in some way for the for the lack of uh, Leo Messi being there but what kills me then is you see the league and people covering the league focusing in on the dude with the sign that's like this much for plane tickets uh... this much for tickets and I didn't even see Messi like as a league and as people who cover it we got to stop promoting that as being funny like that's just it's not a good look it's not what we want it's not that that shouldn't be the headline yeah no i i agree completely now here in la we got hit with the full messy effect to the point where like the officiating even turned against us so cost us a win <laughs> yeah but, I'm, um, I'm keeping my tinfoil hat on that because messi <laughs> didn't play in chicago last year that he has to play this year and and we'll we'll get our money's worth out of it or if he ends up playing in some of the Argentina friendlies and, and Copa America warmups in Chicago, then maybe he won't. I don't know. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, yeah. Another thing I was going to ask you about, uh, because you mentioned we were, we were talking about Soldier Field, right? And how huge it is, right? Um, there's been all that talk about how the Chicago Bears are looking for a location to build a new stadium. And I keep hearing that, yes, they found something. No, they haven't. Yes, they have. No, they haven't. Um, eventually, they're going to find someplace, right? And it makes me wonder what's going to happen to Soldier Field because I know that it's considered like a historical monument. You can't really do much to the exterior, right? But what's right. going to happen to that location as far as the Chicago Fire? Are there any plans for Chicago Fire to go and find like their own stadium? Are they going to try to build a new stadium within the premises of Soldier Field to incorporate all the architecture? Is there any talk like that at all? Or is it just going to remain like it is yeah so the fire are are in wait and see mode you know they have not put anything out publicly other than we understand the situation that's going on with the bears and we're going to keep our eye on it like that's that's kind of where they're at they are the second tenant in soldier field behind the bears right now um and for those who don't know the soldier field stadium is actually owned by the chicago park district and mm -hmm. so they're the ones who are making the, the lease agreements with the bears and the fire and the fire have to play a few games back out in Bridgeview um, because there's a conflict with some of the Chicago bears home games. Once, once we get into the NFL season. So uh, they are the second tenant there. They're keeping an eye on things. Joe Mansueto, the Chicago fire owner and, and founder of Morningstar, the investment firm, like the guy's got the money to build a stadium uh, and, and he could easily bring other investors in, I think to, to the Chicago fire to help with that, They've done a great job getting sponsors for pretty much everything this season. So I think he he could do pretty well to, to have the money to build a new stadium, a new soccer-specific stadium if he wants it. There's a couple properties in the Chicago area that, that a lot of fans have been suggesting, but again, nothing from the front office. Uh, from the Bears' perspective, though, they're the first domino to fall. Even the Chicago White Sox, uh, the baseball team on the south side, I don't know if, if you guys know us, if you, if you guys out in LA have heard of the White Sox, like we're the other <laughs> Chicago baseball team. Yeah, 2005 um, World Series champs. 
Thank you. Remember. Thank you. We're still there. We still we still remember. Uh, but <laughs> they have even said maybe we want to explore a new stadium or sell the team and move it to Nashville. That's kind of the other little like hush hush. People Ooh. were kind of mentioning that. Uh yeah, since the owner is like Yeah. The the owner is like two hundred some years old and uh his kids don't want anything to do with it, supposedly. So that that was another kind of domino that the fire were kind of monitoring, hey, maybe that space might might open up uh at some point in the future. But getting back to the Bears, they own property in Arlington Heights, one of the northwest suburbs. It was former Arlington Park racetrack, horse racing track. So it's like a couple hundred acres. They've got it all. They've demolished everything. It's just open space for the Bears to develop should they want to do it. Now they're going back and saying, well, we want to build a new stadium on the lakefront. Uh, so quick geography lesson, as you're moving south on the lakefront, you've got the Field Museum, Soldier Field, parking garage, parking lot, and then the McCormick Place Convention Center. Essentially what the plans are would be to flip that. So you'd have the Field Museum, and then you'd have a lot of green space, a little parking, uh, soccer fields, baseball fields, and then right in front of McCormick Place, where the current South lot is, would be a brand new NFL stadium for the Bears. Uh, people don't know how that's going to go, how you're going to build a $5 billion stadium on the lakefront and not have delays and backups, and what would the teams do in the meantime? Uh, there's also a couple special interest groups that we anticipate will file lawsuits against anyone that would ever try to change things. Uh, okay. So it's a huge uphill battle. I probably rattled on about this for way too long for you. But from an MLS perspective, the fire are keeping an eye on things. At, at the very least, they could go back to Bridgeview for better or worse. You know, if the pigeons can find me home, I'm sure the fire could at some point, right? That's a good um, point. Just out of curiosity, like just my own curiosity, uh, I know that soccer games have been played at Wrigley Field has the fire ever played any games there or, or entertain the idea of doing an exhibition match there? I don't think the fire have ever played there. And I can't remember the last time a soccer game had been played at Wrigley. But what's interesting is the Cubs ownership, uh, Tom Ricketts, president of the ownership group, his wife actually is the new owner of the Chicago Red Stars, uh, the professional women's team here in Chicago. And they just announced not too long ago, they're going to be having a match at Wrigley Field. Go figure. Hey. So the women's team is going to get there before the men's team does. And that's kind of generating some some fun little buzz about it. But I, you know, with Joe Mansueto and, and the investment he's put in to, uh, you know, having the fire have their own identity, I don't think he'd want to put that back in, in Wrigley Field and have it mixed in with, with Wrigleyville and the Cubs. Um, and anything like that. Plus, we've seen college football games get played there, and it's just a logistical mess. <laughs> trying <laughs> trying to figure out where the lines go, and yeah. corners are too close to the wall, and all that sort of thing. So I don't think it would be uh, an easy fix for the fire to do that. Yeah, I just think it would be fun. Kind of like those uh, NHL Heritage Classic matches that are played you know, in the outdoors. Just have like a one-off, maybe once every so often, just for fun, just to do something a little bit different, right? And give uh, Chicago Fire fans something to look forward to other than, all right, we're heading to Cavernous Soldier Field again, you know? And <laughs> let's go, boys. Uh, <laughs> yeah, tw 20,000 tickets in a 61,000-seat stadium. Yeah, it, it does feel a bit cavernous at times, that's for sure. Okay. Well, we're here on this side. Uh, the Galaxy, they've been defying odds throughout the season. Um, a lot of people were talking about hey, if we're six games in and the team isn't doing well, do we get to kick Danny out? Uh, what about 12 games in? You know, what about halfway through the season? You know, if the team isn't doing so well, can we get rid of uh, Greg Vanny then? But uh, you look at the standings right now, they're currently in second place right behind RSL by one point. Um, Kelsey, like I said, have been defying the odds. They've been bucking the trend wherever they could. Uh, they've had issues in the past against Seattle Sounders, uh, especially Greg Vanny, uh, and um, they, they managed to do, do well against Seattle. Uh, he had a very difficult time with Peter Vermees in Kansas City, and Galaxy was able to defeat Kansas City in Kansas City. And the team was undefeated in May. 
And this is where it brings me to what I was trying to talk about, which is it's exactly one year since Chris Klein uh, left the club. Thanks again to our buddies at CLTFC Fan TV. Like I said earlier, in lieu of the uh, Charlotte FC, because it was that defeat to Charlotte FC that put things over the edge and uh, caused uh, Dan Beckerman to come down from AEG and uh, tell Chris Klein, we wish you, we wish you the best in your future endeavors. See you. <laughs> uh, since then, um, it's been kind of, at first it was kind of like a slow burn, but the team has uh, completely rebuilt itself. It's a lot of people think that uh, things are fine as they are now, but I, I constantly, I think that this, this team is still not in its final form. There's a lot of things that could still happen during the summer transfer window, but from what we've seen so far, it's pretty good. Um, now something I wanted to bring up, uh, is well, well, earlier first of all, today from using the phrase slow burn, all fire related puns are property of Chicago this weekend. All right. That out there. We, we just beat the Dallas burn right let's have that one <laughs> okay that's a fair point touche <laughs> there you go look at that two 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 teams dealing with fire back and back to back <laughs> so uh, I'm going to bring up um, a statistic uh, that corner of the galaxy uh, mentioned earlier today they said with 28 points from 16 games uh, LA galaxy have tied Banny's best start since joining the club uh, galaxy also had 28 points to 16 games in 2021 uh, I saw that and I retweeted um, what happened the rest of the season. I said after 2021, yeah, the Galaxy had won nine games and after 16, drawn one and lost six. However, after that, they only won four games the rest of the season and they fell out of the playoffs after RSL leapfrogged them on decision day with a goal at the death in a controversial match at Sporting KC. Uh, I'm not trying to say that LA Galaxy is going to fall apart here at the end, but they have to be very mindful of lessons from the past. And that means taking care of business. And that begins with going to places like Chicago and getting a result. Uh, a lot of people are saying Galaxies went through a run where they're playing a lot of difficult teams and not to, I'm sorry, Nick, not to like, step on Chicago or anything, but Chicago's not doing well, right? So a lot of people are saying they have to win. They absolutely have to win. So a lot of people are on their way to Chicago right now. A lot of Galaxy are traveling supporters. And um, with traveling supporters, uh, Nick, this is a fun part where you get to tell me what is there to do in Chicago? I've never been there myself. I hope to yeah. one day soon. But for fans that are traveling to Chicago, what uh what options do they have for bars restaurants i mean obviously the tourist destinations are there but things that only somebody who lives here would know that like hey you got to take this place out this place is sure. great for this and also uh second part of the question uh tailgating uh is there tailgating uh what what is the match the experience and what should visiting supporters expect for sure. Um, so full disclosure, I've never actually lived in the city, just always around it. And and <laughs> yes, I, I know scandal here. But but thankfully, I have a wife who is a city girl. And every opportunity when we were dating or newly married, she's like, we're going into the city. Let's go. We got to try a new restaurant out. We got to go try a new place to go. So uh, a little bit of knowledge from that. But but I will say if you if you have the time, it's a little further from Soldier Field. Uh, if you go into the neighborhood, the West Loop on Randolph Street, it's restaurant row. There are just tons of trendy restaurants and bars uh, that are there. You can find any any style of food, any fusion, um, just Randolph Street, West Loop, tons of great restaurants, great place to be. But again, it's a little far, far from the stadium. So, you know, if you don't have much time, I would say you want to look at something, a little restaurant, bar. Uh, there's a place called Exchequer, pizza place. Loved going there as a kid. Loved going back when, I, when I'm when i in the city. Uh, good pizza, good beer. Uh, that's not too far. Look for something around uh, the Art Institute or um, kind of Millennium Park there. Like that's, those are kind of the areas where you'd find something and then be able to hop an Uber or Lyft uh, to get to Soldier Field. Um, let's see what if there anything else that jumps out. Oh, one of our one of my Twitter followers recommended Pequod's Pizza. 
excellent, excellent Chicago style pizza. Well known people who, you know, you, you graduate college, you move to the city, you party all night, you go get your Pequods, you grow up, you move out to the suburbs. Like people still drive like an hour, hour and a half in from the suburbs to go get Pequods pizza. So that is wow. definitely a place if you got the time to go check it out. Uh, but Lou Malnati's, that's the staple for deep dish. Portillo's is the is the staple for Chicago style hot dogs. Uh, when it comes to the actual stadium and the tailgating, uh, yes, tailgating is allowed. Uh, if you are in the south lot, that is where all the supporter sections will set up before the match. They'll usually get there right around 4, 430. I think officially the parking lot opens up at 430. Uh, but to my knowledge, they're not turning anyone away early. Um, so get to the south lot. It's an open lot. You can tailgate. You can bring your grills. You can bring your coolers. The supporters sections each all have their own little thing going on. So one of them has kegs. Another one has Chicago handshakes, which is a shot of Malort Whoa. and a PBR. Oh, Malort. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. 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 I'm so make sure you try some of that when you're in Chicago. Just <laughs> don't hate yourself enough before you do. Uh, another supporters group will have uh, – they they have a taco truck and they're giving out tacos to everybody, kind of a free will donation thing. There's a, a the fanbulance. It's a, an ambulance made up for the Chicago fire. And usually you'll see some of the other kind of uh, smaller sponsors walking around, handing out whatever trendy drink is there or whatever little swag they have. So uh, the, the lake side end of the South lot is where all the supporters were gather. Uh, but if you are parking, and the lot just closer to Soldier Field, the Waldron deck, you can tailgate on the top level. That's where you see a lot of the families, a lot of the youth teams hanging out, getting little pickup games started in the parking lot there. Uh, just if you are in the lower decks of the parking garage, no grilling. Kind of makes sense, but the, right. they'll enforce that on you. Uh, but if you want a little tip, if you're making a weekend of it, uh, the museum campus, the walking path along the lakefront, uh, a couple of years back, my wife and I took the kids got to the field museum, parked there right when they opened and just left our car there for the day. We hmm. took a took an Uber into Greek town, got some good Greek food. Uh, that's that's a not not too far a trip from Soldier Field. Uh, Greek islands, Athena, two best places, in my opinion. Yeah, and I was about uh, to ask you about the Greek food. I was like, you got to oh, yeah. the Greek food. But we just left our car in, in the Field Museum parking lot, and it's right next to Soldier Field, and we were able just to kind of walk into the game. So that, that worked out really well for us. Awesome. Um, just a quick question. What is the the atmosphere with uh, the Chicago supporters, and are they, like, welcoming to visiting supporters, depending on the team? Do you think if a Galaxy fan were to walk up and be like, hey, what's up? You know, I'm visiting. Are they going to turn them away, or are they going to be like, hey, come on, have a beer? Have some allure. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think they would be very welcoming. Uh, first of all, we all know that the team is not playing very well right now. So it's not like we're we're out there like puffing the chest, like you can't come talk to the top team in the conference. No, there's <laughs> none of that. Um, they, they are really welcoming. Good group of guys, good group of girls, uh, you know, everyone else who's out there. Uh, I, I wouldn't try to go sit in the middle of the supporter section right. during a match like that. That's just kind of an obvious thing. But yeah, during the tailgate, everyone's really open, welcoming, drinks are flowing, telling stories, having good times. Uh, yeah, it's been great. Okay. Um, now let's shift our attention to the match itself before we get into some of the more detailed things. Let me mention the pro referee assignments for this match uh, between Chicago Fire and LA Galaxy. Uh, main referee is Marcos de Oliveira. Uh, with assistant Brian Dunn, Stephen McGonagall, and the fourth referee being Jeremy Shear. Uh, VAR is Jose Carlos Rivero and assistant VAR Peter Balsunas. Now, I did a little research on uh, the ref. I do this every week now. Uh, since 2014, De Oliveira has refereed 102 MLS matches, three of them uh, with LA Galaxy, yielding in two wins, zero draws, and one loss for the LA Galaxy with one of those wins being on the road. Uh, as far as Chicago, he's done 12 matches with Chicago, three wins, three draws, six losses. And at home at Soldier Field or at uh, Bridgeview, three wins, one draw, three losses. 
And something I noticed, he calls at least two yellow cards per match, but doesn't hand out many red cards. I think he's only handed out one in the, like the last 15 or 16 matches. Hmm. So um, we'll look at that. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, Nick, what's the player availability for the fire right now? Are there any like glaring issues uh, with the club? You mentioned um, something about Shakiri that I'm sure uh, fans are very interested in knowing. Uh, so in addition to him, uh, is there anything else that Galaxy fans should know about heading into this match? Sure. Well, to to jump on what you said about the yellow cards and the officiating, uh, the, the Fire do have some yellow card prone players. So when I saw you put your tweet out about this is, you know, maybe two yellow cards a game, I'm, I'm thinking that's going to be the under this weekend uh, <laughs> with, with the Fire feeling a little emotional, a little on a high after, you know, two straight draws after a terrible, <laughs> terrible start to the season. They're starting to feel a little bit better. They're starting to uh, feel that they're creating a lot of opportunities and just not finishing. So with that momentum, uh, with with really wanting to win against a top team like the Galaxy and do it at home, I think there's going to be a lot of emotions. And it would not surprise me at all if you see – Federico Navarro, our defensive midfielder, Carlos Ferran, uh, one of our center backs. If those two guys pick up yellow cards, uh, Fabian Herbers, you know, he's he's the most tenured player with the Chicago Fire. He's been with the club five seasons now, and he still has some of those moments where if he just kind of mentally checks out, he'll come in on a, on a real late tackle and could pick up a card himself. Uh, you never know what Kellen Acosta is going to do either, like what he's going to get himself into. So uh, given what you said about the referee, I, I would put the under at two yellow cards, even against the fire in this match. Uh, but as far as player availability goes, yeah, let's start with Shakiri. He, again, somehow gets called up to the Swiss, inter, uh, Swiss national team for the Euros. And Chicago fans are like, don't you guys have any other players? <laughs> like, how do you keep calling Shakiri? He's played in, what, five World Cups for them now? And how many yeah. international matches? I don't know, but but he is gone. He is uh, on international duty. The rumors are that he has played his last game for the fire. Uh, these are rumors that you're kind of hearing from fan sources, uh, not so much anyone reporting on what uh, a league official or a team official is saying. Uh, but we all know that Shakiri has been maybe the biggest bust, not in fire history, but maybe MLS history with an $8 million price wow. tag and over two and a half seasons. I think he's got what, like 13 goal contributions or something like that? Like, it's it, it's terrible. Like, his statistics are terrible, and his play has been terrible, and his attitude has been terrible. So mm -hmm. that's the speculation that he has gone to Switzerland and will stay there. Uh, if, if your listeners don't know, the ownership group for the Fire owns mm -hmm. FC Lugano in the Swiss League, and there have been a few moves between the clubs over the last several years. Uh, this offseason, they brought over Marin Haile, or last offseason, they brought over uh, Marin Haile Selassie. This offseason, they brought over Alana Ragoni, uh, who's going through a bit of a rough patch. I don't know if he'll be available if he picked up a knock. Uh, but they've also sent Casper Shabilko, uh, Ignacio Aliceda, and I am, I'm Space Justin Reynolds. That's it. Uh, young defender. They've sent them all over to Lugano over the past three seasons or so. Uh, so that has kind of been an outlet for some of these players they need to get off the books and players they want to get some more minutes to. As far as availability, it's a little bit in flux. Um, I I have not looked up the injury report, but uh, Chris Mueller has been out the last last match. Martin Haile Selassie is coming back from an injury. We'll see how much time he gets um, or if Chris he and Chris Mueller are kind of rotating on the wing. Uh, as far as our center backs go, I think you'll see Chihos and Tehran start. Maybe you see Salquist, Tobias Salquist come back and get Chihos uh, a little bit of a breather. I did hear Andrew Goodman picked up a knock, and he may not be available. Our left, uh, our left back, who to the Galaxy's uh, pleasure, will he's been part of the, the biggest offensive revival over the last couple of weeks. He's been the guy who's really starting to create push forward. I mean, you guys have watched. Goodman over his MLS career, you know what he's capable of. Uh, and he was really finding a rhythm with the fire and then may not be available this weekend. So uh, if if the Galaxy can get running at the Chicago fire back line and really put them under some pressure, tire them out, I think you'll have a big advantage in this match. 
So uh, let me uh, backtrack a bit to Shakiri. You mentioned um, a lot of different reasons why he never really panned out as a the player that Chicago and even MLS to a greater degree uh, wanted uh, for the club. Uh, you mentioned his attitude. Uh, what is it? What 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 is it about his his attitude that just never fit with the club? Because from from my point of view, every time I I watch highlights or I catch a Chicago Fire match, it seems like he does not did not want to be there, or his his heart was just wasn't in it. Is this something that that was apparent from day one, or it just changed over time? I think it was. It- hindsight's 2020 right so i think you can look back to his first season and say yeah it was there we just didn't see it and we made excuses for it that first season it was going into the world cup he kind of got the gareth bale treatment where we all know he's just here to stay in shape for the world cup we're really not expecting him to play 90 minutes every match give 110 percent lead the fire to the playoffs that wasn't the expectation in his first season he again he was here to to stay in shape but last season, that wasn't the case. It's time to step up, Mr. Trophies with Bayern Munich and Liverpool and, you know, records with Stoke and all that. Time for you to to really step up and be a leader here. And it it never materialized. I don't think he ever really built any relationships with any of the players or the coaching staff, uh, first and foremost. And, yeah, I think he was just content to kind of trot around and collect his paycheck. Part of his frustration, I think, is he he's played with such a higher caliber of player than than these MLS players bef- uh, that he's with now. And I'm and I'm not trying to insult anybody here, but let's be honest, Casper Shabilko isn't anyone who's played in the Premier League, right? So Shakiri plays a certain way. He likes to quickly release his strikers and his wingers, and he's looking for them. And I appreciate that he looks forward, but that's just not the style of play. That wasn't what the coaching staff wanted. That wasn't the players that were around him. So he was kind of trying to jam a square peg into a round hole with his style of play, and it frustrated him. Uh, There were some rifts in the locker room, and, you know, he just couldn't motivate himself. And then you see that Miami game last year, 60,000 people sell out, places jump in. We got to take it to to the hot thing hot team in the league and he has his best game ever so it's like well why can't you do that in front yeah. of eighteen thousand people on a, on a wednesday night so that that's where a lot of it's been i haven't even okay. talked about the fact that he was the highest paid player in mls when they signed him and he's still the fourth or fifth highest paid player in the league right now so even if you just look dollars to goals huge disappointment yeah unfortunately something that wasn't a huge disappointment I want you to tell me about this was that that match against uh, CF Montreal and uh, that funny, funny, funny goal by Kellen Acosta. Uh, were you at the stadium when that happened? Cause yeah, can you explain to people that didn't get a chance to watch that game exactly what happened? Cause if, if you go back and you watch the end of that match on YouTube, it's going to blow your mind. It's divine intervention. It's the windy city miracle over there. That's, that's <laughs> what I was calling it. I actually did not go to that game. That was St. Patrick's Day weekend, and I was not about to fight through like tens of thousands of drunk Irish Chicagoans to get to Soldier Field. <laughs> I mean, I I don't feel that old, but sometimes I act like the old man. I'm like, ah, you keep your crowds. I'm just gonna watch on my couch. So I I ended up watching that game, and yeah, for the for the Fire, who were down three to one, to come back and win it four three in extra time you thought that would be the turning point of the season that your it was your two big off season signings. It was Kuypers with the equalizer and Acosta with the game winner. You thought that would be a turning point for it, but they could never keep the momentum up or never figure out um, the, the tactical approach or what made it work. And maybe the fire are going to have to rely on luck because like you said, that last goal and Kellen Acosta admitted it in his post game, he was, Within his own half, he was even, I'd say he was closer to his goal box, to his 18-yard box, than he was to the center circle even. Like, that's how deep he was in his own half. And he said, I was just trying to make something happen. I was just trying to lob the ball forward, get it to somebody in the last minute of the game, and maybe we get lucky. 
And he hit that ball so high, got caught up in that in that jet stream. <laughs> and why can't I remember Montreal's keeper? But but he comes out to grab it and too late realizes the wind has carried that ball right over his head and into the back of the net. It was like a 65 yard goal or something like that. And, and that thing was up there like a knuckleball, right? Just kind of flop flapping around and oh yeah. I, I had I have rarely seen a soccer ball do those things that it did up in the wind there. Oh man, it must have been uh, quite a reaction at the stadium. You look at the fans, they're looking out in disbelief. Well, I was going nuts we'll in my see... living room. And, and the fun to, to tell a quick story about it, my yeah. wife is out and she's bringing uh, she's bringing my son home and, and they're checking the scores as she's coming home and I'm watching the game and they're down three to one. And then she gets home like 10 minutes later and we're jumping up and screaming, they won, they won, they won. And she's like, how did they score three goals in 10 minutes? It's like, <laughs> she couldn't comprehend it. And yeah. it was just so much fun to watch her, the look on her face and, and to see my son like jumping up and down when they got the win. And uh, yeah, that's one of two wins on the season for the fire. Oof. Will there be some looks of disbelief if they get a bigger sword against the Galaxy this weekend? If they get a one against the Galaxy? A win. A, a win? win? Uh, yeah, there'll it's be a lot what? of this. It's been 14 years. <laughs> I mean, dude, keep your 14 years. Like, let's just focus right now. We're we're <laughs> nine games without a win. Uh, there, There's even a fan uh, account that has changed the C in the logo to an L and is just posting oh. that every time. Like, that's... That's rough when your own home fans are doing that, but it's not not totally out of the, the out of unreasonableness. But uh yeah, there will be a lot of shock and disbelief if if they can pull off a victory against the Galaxy. It's definitely not expected. All right. Well, on this side, the only real injury uh, that we could say is well, Joseph Paintsio. Joseph Paintsio, he's been out with a hamstring injury. Um, there's no rush, there's no real rush to bring him back. Uh, he um, he played a lot of matches uh, before joining LA Galaxy, both with Genk and with the Ghanaian football team during CAF tournament. And so uh, when he came here, he had some miles on him, and he just happened to hurt his hamstring. And if you played you know soccer, football at any point in your life, and you've suffered a hamstring injury, you know how testy those can be. You have to be very careful in trying to heal it because otherwise it'll come back and it'll haunt you the rest of your life. So I'm sure Al Galaxy is trying real hard to avoid that, especially with the investment that they made in Joseph Paintsill when they brought him over. Uh, so there's no real rush to bring him back, especially because uh, the man stepping in for him, Diego Fagundes, has done a very fantastic job with the club. Uh, I know awesome fans uh, are still foaming at the mouth that uh, management let him go. But thank you so much. <laughs> we, we, we love having him here. I mean, the fact that he can fill in for Paintsill like that is is wonderful. And we're still waiting for the debut of center back Edmiro Garces, who came over from uh, Colombia or like six weeks ago now at a time when the club was really hurting for center backs. Uh, they had a lot of injuries and players that were missing because of disciplinary issues. But now all the center backs are OK. So he's just kind of just sitting there and they're waiting for the right moment to put him in. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of chatter like, Maybe it was against FC Dallas. Maybe it'll be against the like, Chicago Fire. Eh, who knows? You you might see him uh, make his debut for the LA Galaxy this weekend. Other than that, um, there's no real telling uh, what kind of roster Vanny is going to put out there because there's been so much rotation and, and they want to keep everybody fresh. I mean, at this point, our clubs have played a lot of matches in a short period of time during this time of, this, of the calendar. So, you know, we can't expect to see the, the everyday starters there um, line up. Yeah, but, I wanted to ask uh, you, because yes, when sir. you were going back and saying, like, you know, the Galaxy, they, they're not their finished product yet, my mind immediately went to the defense. Like, that's yeah. that's where they needed to focus. And and so I'm glad to hear that they, they address that whenever this player actually gets some minutes. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is, from the fires perspective, like I said, we've kind of ran back the same front office and the same coaching staff. How did the galaxy go about rebuilding after Klein and, and, you know, bringing in Vanny and, and getting players, what has made the difference from the last couple seasons to this year? Will Kuntz. Uh, Will Kuntz is a former assistant GM with LAFC. Uh, he's also um, 
be uh, an employee for the New York Yankees. And he mentioned that uh, many years ago, he, one of his dream job, his dream job was to work as GM for the LA Galaxy. Uh, for God knows what reason or other, at the time, the front office said, no, 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 no thanks. And so he's like, okay, I want to take my ball down the street to the noisy neighbors and I'm going to join them. And he Quite also wrote them ball one of the, the strongest teams in MLS. Um, with all the criticism that Chris Klein and Jovan Karofsky, uh, who was another member of the front office, uh, received during this time, and it, it all boiled over with the Klein out protest, and people were including Jovan Karofsky as well. Eventually, both of them got the boot. And then at that point, it was trying to rebuild. I, I mentioned Dan Beckerman. Dan Beckerman is the president of AEG, who also owns the LA Kings, um, the LA Live, uh, Staples Center, the, the, the crypto.com arena, whatever it's called now. Uh, they own a lot of stuff. AEG owns a lot. I mean, Philip yeah. Anschutz is the, the CEO of, uh, of uh, AEG, and the MLS trophy is named after him, <laughs> the Philip Anschutz trophy. Uh, but anyway... Uh, going back to it, like this, this is an organization that has a lot of money, and, and for a while, a lot of Galaxy fans were thinking, "Wow, they must not really be paying attention to us. They're, they must be focused on the other investments, the LA Kings, who were kind of going through the same thing. The LA Kings were, for the longest time, they were uh, they were a perennial champion, especially I mean, a perennial contender for the Stanley Cup, especially after the two cups they won in the early uh, 2010s. And but then the Kings kind of fell to the wayside. And the LA Kings also needed to rebuild themselves. It seemed like the LA Kings had done that. I think it's kind of fell apart this year. But uh, there was more attention being paid to both the LA Kings and the LA Galaxy, although it took a little longer for the Galaxy when they did. Um, Will Kuntz uh, was given the opportunity to come in, and he assumed the role of general manager once um, – uh, which is something the LA Galaxy did not have, by the way. The LA Galaxy had not had a proper general manager since uh, Dennis Teclose left the club uh, for the Netherlands. Uh, something like two or three years ago. Uh, and so it was, who's the general manager? I mean, there was a lot of things the team was lacking. They didn't have a scouting department, like a real scouting department. They didn't have an analytics department. Um, there's just a laundry list of things that this club absolutely needed that you would think uh, a, a club at this caliber, a, a club of the history that it has, would already have established, but no, they were, they were cutting corners wherever they could the front office at, at the time. So bringing in a general manager as Will Kuntz, he kind of brought a lot of stability. He already had like a list of players that he was planning to bring in over with LAFC and he, he took the list and he brought it with him. And as you see, they've been slowly rebuilding the club. They brought in um, three big names uh, over, well, two big names over the offseason. Um, and that's just because AEG finally opened up their wallet and said, here is a blank check. Let us know what you need. So they spent close to or over $20 million in acquisitions um, in bringing in uh, Gabriel Peck, who is now uh, from, from, um, uh, from the Brazilian League. I think he's playing for Flamengo. And uh, they brought him in. He's a young guy who is pretty raw still, has a lot of learning to do, but we see him getting better and better as time progresses. And um, he is now the highest uh, transfer. He, has, he, he commanded the highest transfer fee in the history of LA Galaxy. So they wow. brought him in. I think it was $12 million. They brought in um, uh, Joseph Paintsil, uh from Genk. And like I said, he played for Ghana. And they also brought in Miki Yamane, who was playing in Japan. He was also a former member of the Japanese national team. And he's been, he's a, one of our, he's a right back, I'll say. Yeah, right back. And uh, he's paired in, he's paired very well with uh, Mai Yoshida, who's a former captain of the Japanese national team. And um, as one of our wingbacks, Yamane is one of those guys where he comes in, he plays, he does his job. You never complain about him he, because he's just so steady. And yeah. in fact, um, in the match against Houston Dynamo, he made a save at the goal line and he was very instrumental in getting that victory over Houston. So he's somebody that we're very happy to have. Joseph Pinto can't say enough about him. Uh, unfortunately, he's hurt right now. You're not going to get to see him against Chicago. He's 
It's incredible speed. Breakout speed is amazing. Yeah. And he's created a lot of trouble for uh, MLS defenses. Uh, you can kind of expect something similar with Gabriel Peck. Um, he's a guy that usually likes to attack the box. If he gets around his defender, he'll give you a lot of issues. He'll go in and he'll either take the ball straight to the goal or he'll cut back and send it to somebody like a Dejan Jovalich who can just come in and for the tap in. Um, but the guy, you could, you could, you could see he has a, that, that Jogo Bonito in him. He, you'll saw that, you'll see that flare every now and then. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we, we see more from him, especially because, like I said, paint seals out. So we're going to need to see more contributions from him. And uh, so those are the three big guys that the Galaxy brought in during the offseason. And yeah. they've been a very big factor in this club um, rebuilding itself. The other thing was rebuilding the relationship with the fans. And you see that a lot because Will Coons has shown to be a man of the people from day one. He went out to where the supporters hang out prior to the matches to talk to them, to mingle with them, to hear from them directly, you know, questions, concerns, just, just taking photos with people. Uh, and that's something yeah. that we hadn't seen in a really long time. Uh, so immediately uh, this guy has ingratiated himself with the galaxy fan base. Uh, when galaxy goes on the road, he's been shown to actually go down to where the visiting supporters are and sit with them during matches so don't be surprised if he shows up in Chicago and he's there with the fans. Um, mm -hmm. So all these things have really helped not only bring people back to the stadium, but the club has shown that success on the field. And of course that brings in the casuals and it's just been this wonderful atmosphere at the games. It hasn't been perfect. Uh, Galaxy still have, they have, they have a lot of rough edges. Uh, you, you mentioned the defense, right? Um, Galaxy had given up, like, I don't know, like, at this point, it might be 13, maybe 14 goals off set pieces, which Ooh. is incredible. Because then you think, well, the defense, you know, they've given up a lot of goals. The defense must be trash. Well, yes and no. They're <laughs> terrible. At, they, were, well, they have been terrible at defending on set pieces. It seems like yeah. they're getting better. But in the run of play, Galaxy usually does not give up many goals. Um, okay. Well, so now I'll add to that, because the Chicago Fire this offseason hired a set pieces coach. Uh, to specifically <laughs> work, work with them on it i don't think they've scored a goal off a set piece this year and i know they've given up probably around 10 or 12 so uh that's that's something that these teams might have in common at least all right well we're about to get to predictions but before we give our predictions there's something else i want to throw out there that might give you something to ponder about nick all right and that is since his tenure with the la galaxy greg vanny has yet to win three games in a row we're at two. They beat Houston. They beat the FC Dallas. And now here they are heading into the Windy City. What's your prediction, Nick? I'm trying to – so I did my podcast uh, on on Monday night, and I'm trying to remember what I predicted to stay consistent here. And I – and I, I initially said it was going to be a draw because I, I saw the fire – throwing everything in their or their game against Orlando this Wednesday night. Uh, they ended up with a draw against Orlando after a, just, just a hash of a defensive play early on. Oh, uh, God. And I said... Let's not even get into that because there's the whole MLS tweet and then it disappeared. And, oh, yeah. what a lightning rod for for controversy, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the, I thought they would beat Orlando and then settle for like a draw against LA. That was what I was thinking. Now that we've got the Orlando game out of the way and, and they're kind of feeling it, I'm, you know, I'm just going to give your fans a little something to, to talk about here. I, I think the fire get a three, two victory in, at the Ooh. death, man. Ooh. I I'm going to, I'm going to try and be optimistic here. As bad as things have been, Shakiri's out of the picture. Kuiper's scored in the last match. And uh, one of the guys over at men in red 97 media, uh, Tim Hatza, pointed out that of the Fire's last four goals, though they have been spread out over several games, over the Fire's last four goals, Kuypers has two of them and an assist. So he is, I, I think he's going to have himself a game, especially if, if you guys are giving up goals on set pieces, then he'll he'll get one there for sure. So I'm going out on a limb. I'm feeling optimistic. Seriously, this is just water. I'm not sipping on anything too strong here. But yeah, 3-2 <laughs> Fire victory in over in stoppage time 
Hey, you want to plug your water while you're at it? <laughs> <laughs> no, tune in to feed the fire. They're not paying you guys. <laughs> well, um, I want to be optimistic on this side too, because I want to get that monkey off our back. It's like, you never get those three wins in a row. Damn it. And this is like a golden opportunity. Uh, well, you did mention Shakiri's gone though. And I know that we've said in the past that she, uh, Chicago plays better without Shakiri there, right? Yeah. Or seemingly they do, do they, or do they not? They, no, they, they're, the results are there. Like that's not an eye test subjective thing. Like when you look at points, and games with or without him, they have more points without him. And the Fire are currently on a nine-game winless streak, uh, but their last two matches without Shakiri, they've they've drawn. So, I mean, the proof's in the results. Okay. Well, in that case, <laughs> I'm gonna be positive from our point of view and <laughs> gotta buck the trend, right? Gotta buck the trend. That's the theme this year. So I'm gonna say two to one Galaxy. Uh, Chicago puts up a really good fight. Uh, sorry to pile on the misery. Damn it. I hate to do that, but uh, somebody's got to win, man. right? It's a sports, right? Yeah. Uh, but to show that it's no hard feelings, I'm wearing my Mike McGee jersey. I wish I could. <laughs> yes, that's awesome, dude. Mike McGee. You had baby. his vodka yet? Have you tried that? I have not had Sneaky Fox yet. Yeah, neither uh, have I. I, 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 uh, I wish I could at some point just to say, here we go. You know, supporting Mike McGee, the mayor of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the mayor uh, but... that nobody knows about. <laughs> Yeah, fortunately. <laughs> um, but yeah, two to one. I, I say two to one. You say three to Chicago. Um, more than anything, we expect. A, I mean, we're, we're really looking forward to an entertaining match. Uh, I think that's the thing that everybody always wants at MLS. Please, no, no weird goals that MLS will tweet out and then take back. And if you if you don't know what that what we're talking about, don't don't even bother looking because the goal itself is pretty pretty bleh. But I think um, uh, Chicago had nine defenders in the box and uh, uh, Orlando had four players in the box and somehow toe poked it in. <laughs> like, yeah, the ball's bouncing around like a like a pinball, right? Like, bum, 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 and was it, it goes in and everybody's like, what the hell? <laughs> but, but, but I will say when when they released the schedule and I got my season tickets this year, I circled this June 1st match against the Galaxy. I'm like, whatever's going on in life. I want to be there. I want to see the Galaxy play. Like I haven't seen the Galaxy live before, so this this game was a was a point of emphasis for me. So hopefully it doesn't disappoint. Well, there you go. And to show no more hard feelings, so I got my my World Cup in honor of uh, Chicago Fire. Hopefully winning that World Cup one day. That's never gonna die, man. That joke will never go away. <laughs> <laughs> Swinesiger is like what? Yeah. What does that look on his face? Like huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's always it's a pleasure to talk to you and have you on the show. Uh, we look forward to having you again um, well, probably next year, right? A year yeah, from now. So. Um, we got to do some like off-season roundtable type stuff. Yeah, yeah. We got to get all the boys together and just uh, have a nice little chat there. Uh, hopefully uh, this weekend we can all celebrate uh, Columbus Crew winning a CONCACAF Champions Cup because, you know, that, that's a big deal for us here in MLS. Um, I already told those guys, you know, hey, you carry the fate of all, all of us, little one, as you head out to Mount Doom, you know, so we'll get it done, Frodo. <laughs> um, but yeah, once again, hey, Nick, thank you so much. Uh, uh, can you tell people that are interested in uh, in your show or just want to hit you up where they can find you on social media? Absolutely. So every week I put out a podcast. It's available on Spotify, iTunes, Good Pods, wherever you get your podcasts. It's called Feed the Fire, a Chicago Fire podcast. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm on social media at Glasshouse Soccer. And if you want to email me, the address is glasshousesoccer at gmail.com. Uh, I've been doing the podcast for a year and a half. And hopefully now we've got a good routine. I can start putting out some more MLS and soccer based content out there. Yeah. So if you guys see Nick out there, uh, especially travel supporters, if you guys see him in Chicago, please, you know, Give him a what's up, give him a hug, a high five, whatever. Buy him some Greek food. I don't know. <laughs> do anything. You know, make uh make Nick let Nick know that LA cares and be nice to him, please. You know, he's a good guy. But uh you guys can follow me uh, in case you're interested. You've never done it before, you can follow me on Twitter as Edgar Nags, Instagram as well. Uh Nag News also on Instagram and uh Twitter. And uh that's all for today. Everyone, uh thank you so much for joining us. Uh, anything else you want to say, Nick? Not nah, pleasure being here, man. Really excited for the match. Well, as everyone, 
knows, hey, always keep on nagging and Wu-Tang for life, baby. Thank you so much.